Hello, thank you for staying with us. If you're just joining in, this is The Morning Wiggle on NCBN. And um, we have a guest who actually is a friend of the house. We'll be talking about everything Nigeria and specifically um, in relation to the public affairs of Nigeria. You can say economic affairs, you can say political affairs, but everything tied into one. Specifically also, we have been having conversations, at least in the last two days, about the PIB and um, the unfortunate conversations and the threats to the peace and development of Nigeria from militants um, from the South-South area. I would say the Niger Delta area specifically. Mm. I've used the word specifically way too much, but um, let's introduce you to our guest. He is Oganya Abdurazak Maman, who is a public affairs analyst. Hello, good morning, and welcome to the show. Good morning to you. Good morning, viewers. Let's get right into it. Uh, Mr. Maman, of course, uh, you've been on this show a number of times already in this year. Uh, talking about insurgency, banditry, economic downturn, and everything that just has to do with Nigeria remaining as one. In the last week, we have seen um, many agitations, many calls from various stakeholders um, of Nigeria for a restructuring, one of which has been because of um, the Niger Delta and the unresolved issues when it comes to the cleanup, when it comes to them as um, the, uh, as it were, owners of the oil being constantly underdeveloped when they look at how much is coming out of their backyard. Um, what are your thoughts on the recent happenings, especially with the Avengers coming forth? Okay. Once again, good morning. Good morning. Um, well, uh, in terms of threats to national peace and security rising from Niger Delta or uh, Avengers, even some time before now, we have a movement for emancipation of uh, Niger Delta men. We have a uh, Niger Delta vigilante group. You have a uh, general, general Boilof voice in Niger Delta. You have Niger Delta Liberation Force, and what is the what's, what is the uh, aims and objective? In principle, what is the aims and objective of this group? Is always say there are a lot of uh, uh, resources at our disposal being taken away by the Nigerian or the federal government, and the little attention is give, is being given to us, right? In fact, I, if you can recall vividly, before the Fourth Republic, only 5% is you know, uh, allocated of the revenues allocated to the Niger Delta area until 1999, when 13% uh, uh, as we have it today is being allocated to the Niger Delta area, right? And if you look at the, one would have expected that upon this increase in uh, the percentage or allocation you know being accrued to them it should have translated to development create employment create infrastructure create a uh, hospital quality hospital quality road but if you go to the Niger Delta area today and look at the environment you'll be you'll be astonished So the call, the threat, the uh, hostility is consequence of the perpetual perceived marginalization, less giving attention to where the source of Nigeria is coming from. However, the federal government is not alone or it's not, it's not corporate alone in what is happening to Niger data. If you are discussing the Niger data, there are four variables or four, you know, uh, factors we look at. We look at the federal government, you look at the state governors, you look at the, uh, the multinational corporations, you look at the masses. 
The federal government is doing now 13 percent as the allocation to the Niger Delta area, right? To the state governors. And here we are saying that little has shown of what that 13 percent revenue has done to the Niger Delta. I'm sorry, I have to come in here um, specifically mm. because yes. there's a word you you used. Yes. You said perceived marginalization. Yes. Yes. Are you suggesting yes. that these host communities yes. do not have a just cause for calling for better treatment and at least a special allocation to them as host communities of these revenues? I am not discarding their stand to see what they are doing or what they are saying does not exist. But my, well, my position is that the little that is being given to them from the federal government to the state government, even the perceived the the the, the uh, militants masquerading as freedom fighters, also culprit. Can I quickly step in? Um, last week we heard some um, figures. Unfortunately, I don't have them to hand right now. That the federal government was owing. Uh, by Elsa State, for instance, hundreds of millions of dollars um, in remittance. So I'm wondering, that couldn't just be from one year because we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm. So is it possible that um, these militants, although they come out and they seem brash, are on to something? Because if the federal government is owing hundreds of millions of dollars in remittance, then perhaps the federal government is not remitting the 13% as they should. Well... One could, I haven't gotten uh, a fact, right, on, you know, either from my knowledge, every month, the 13% goes as it comes, with, it comes with allocation, monthly allocation. So probably there are other, other uh, issues. Look at Niger Data Development Commission as an example. NDDC. NDDC. <coughs> Lots of money taken there. But if you look at the level of development, because the commission is for development, what has they done? You have not had somebody from elsewhere overseeing the development, the, 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 the commission. It's son of the soil. Who knows the pain of the people? Who's supposed, because who's supposed to know the pain of the people, right? Mm. You can, you can, it's, it's, it's mind blowing to sit down and see that uh, once an once appointee of the uh, federal government, who is actually from the area, right, and know the pain of the people in terms of environmental degradation, people who are, who are used to farming before can no longer go to farm because of oil spirit, right, has the opportunity to take the advantage the, the uh, attention of the federal government to Niger Delta, but all he or she could do is self aggrandizement acquire a lot of things. Some people have uh, jewelries over 14 billion naira. Okay, can I just come <laughs> in there? Because I, I know what you're alluding to, yes. and um, that's the former Minister of Petroleum. Um, but having said that, there is a body called High Prep that had been set up by the government, I think, uh, if my memory serves me right, probably about six years ago. High Prep started off under NMPC, and um, I think in the last year or two has been moved to the Federal Ministry of Environment. There were a lot of um, calls for um, the then Minister of Environment, um, Ms. Amina Mohammed, who now works for the UN, because she was one of the only people from the federal government at that time to actually go down to Ogoni yeah. to look at the oil spill after she did. Vice President Yemi Oshibajo went and had a look as well. However, nothing has really moved from high prep. In fact, there was a little bit of a scandal that they weren't even being paid, and that's on the federal government side. Yeah. So. This is something that um, one, again, cannot but say, well, regardless of the means that these people are using, are they raising fair points? Because as you said, the cleanup has yet yes. to be Yes. You see, done. the federal government is not, uh, is inexcusable 
when discussing some of the perennial issues that relate to, in fact, not only Niger Delta, the entire Nigeria. What you are seeing in Niger Delta today, the attention being given to Niger Delta today, because uh, Nigeria economy is a mono economy, it lies there, right? So there is no amount of uh, gunpowder, there is no amount of uh, military force that you can use to coerce them. It's funny you should say military force because yes. um, I think one of the things that we saw recently in the news is that this new Avenger threat yes. is a response mm. to a new military operation mm. being um, commissioned in the Niger Delta for, for oper I don't know, since you're, you also happen to be a security... Um, That's what, yeah. Yes. So, what are your thoughts on this you new see, army operation? See, because there used to be crocodile you, smile, and yes. now there's a new one. You see, often time, right? That especially here, I have de-emphasized the issue of militarization of you know security. How? What is even the quantity of our military strength that you are everywhere? No. Hmm. There are issues, fundamental issues that has some dysfunctional issues that has brought us to where we are. It is better off to be given attention to the issue of poverty reduction, the issue of quality education, the issue of inf basic infrastructure. Right? There is attention should be better given to such than because when you have you, you start engaging, you have a war in the Northeast, right? A already declared war in the Northeast that is taking a huge amount of money, amount of resources, amount of manpower, amount of human being, right? In the Northeast. You want to go back to uh, Niger Delta, you are engaging the Southwest. Yes, in fact, we are, as, we, as, as we speak right now, there are, there are, there are threats from Southwest. Some people from Southwest are saying we need the Rudua. We, we, we declared our state on, on the first, whatever. Do you understand? Yes. You go back, you go there again, you deploy some. How many? You are spending so much money. And all this, all this clamor, all this agitation are centered on what? What does the common man really want from the government? The government needs to put a thinking cap on how to reduce the dichotomy between the rich and the poor. Government appointee, politics has not to be seen as the most profitable business in Nigeria. Sorry, could you repeat that? Government, mm -hmm. politics, appointee, not to be seen as the biggest, right, profit, profitable business in Nigeria. Okay, but... You know, for us to be able to achieve that, yes. we would also have to ensure that we have a space and a structure that does not allow that. Mm. Do you think we currently have that kind of structure or can potentially have it, given the current situation? You see, in strategic studies, we have sat down many times. There are so many, if you go to the library, there are so many scholars' opinion on the current structure of Nigeria. It's not a perfect structure. But we cannot find a perfect structure in the world. But the fact because that many people... Is, is a, is, is a continuum. St a state is a continuum. It's never ending. There's always a room for improvement, right? Even with the current state. Example. We are, we are clamoring for state police. I'm one of the uh, proponents of community policing, state police, okay? Then, the state in itself has power right now. Because if you are saying state police, we are looking for to devote more power to the state. But look at the little power the state is having. There's no local government now, <laughs> as we speak. I suppose the, the third tier of government. So, sorry, can I clarify? Yes. So, what you're saying, yes. in effect, or le let me just try to, to understand what mm. you're saying. 
you're saying that as it is, mm. administratively, mm. the state is not doing well with the mm. um, devolution of power within itself. Yes. And so, therefore, when speaking about security mm. and wanting to devolve the power of security from federal to state, yes. you think that it won't fare well? Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying, relatively, is that the little power within the state, because state cannot absolutely say that uh, only the federal government control the security, because you end security vote, I think the least state that ends security vote every month is 750 million. 750 million. So every state, the commissioner, that, commissioner of police that's been deployed from Abuja to your state knows that you end 650 million for security vote. So if you have a problem at your domain, and you want to sit down so that IG will call the commission of police, you will mostly you will not be available. Until there are so many calls from the federation or from the media. Pardon me, Mr. Mm. Maman, but yes. that, that, that sounds a little bit contradictory to mm. what we've actually heard several governors mm. say. So, for instance, I'll cite the example of the NSARS um, protest when, um, when a lot of people came out and accused Governor Songwolu of giving the order mm. for the military to step in. Yes. And he, in turn, said that the governor mm. does not have the power to call security services like the army you know, to, to come to such a place as that. After that, we also began to hear that regardless of the fact that the, gov the governor of a state has uh, the security mm. vote, mm. that um, the commissioner of police mm. of the state mm. only takes orders from the IG. Mm. You're saying something in contradiction no, to that? No, I'm s that, that's what I told you. Okay. The commissioner of police takes instruction from the IG. But the state governor provide the purse. Yeah, they provide accommodates the commissioner of police in your state. Okay. Okay. There is a relationship between the state governor and the commissioner of, poli of police. If the governor is determined to end or to reduce the level of chaotic disorder in his state, if he's committed with little on the federal government. He can. But the issue is that it's always, if you say we don't have power, it's always revolved around the fund. But they won't tell you. Most state governors are not ready. Hey, it's federal government job. Have you ever, okay, I, you have so many examples of governors who, who brings down the homes of opposition or dissenting voice and say that uh, where they are occupying is not allocated, right? Is it the federal government? Is it federal government that called those police? That or security agency that accompanied them? It's not. <laughs> it's not. So it appears that we have so it's, people it's, who it's, lack a political way. It's, it's about priority. It's about priority. When the whenever uh, a state government is threatened. The pos his position is threatened, especially in terms of impeachment, in terms of a uh, House of Assembly member. He has less majority in the House. He wants to do any... You see him. He has a charge of security that time because his position is in danger. So he, all the resources available will be deployed to protect his office or his person in the office. So do we, do we, die, what do we blame for this? Do we blame the political structure? Do we blame our political values as a people and, of course, as politicians? Or is it really a matter of the um, security structure? Because, again, if there is no security structure to blame or to hold on to, maybe just maybe people would, ha would be forced to, you know, take on their responsibility. So what would you say is the, you know, reason for this? We'll have our quota to contribute to national development. Also, if there is any issue that is not in tandem with what development is, we, share the, we all share the blames. Because even the politicians emanate from the people. They, didn't, they are not from uh, 
They are part of us. Anti political parties, which is who recruits people who occupies office, begin to sit down, talk about ideology. For example, we have APC ruling the country right now. Uh, I was invited at their uh, APC uh, youth summit. We discussed and I told them that, uh, you see, as far as I'm concerned, APC as a party, as a young party, as, as a youth, why don't the party has National Institute for Legislative Study? For us, parent. APC Institute for Legislative Study. APC Institute for Executive Study. Certified six months, just six months, eight months, twelve months. Aspirant, not candidate. Where if you are aspiring to become an executive, you already know the function of executive. You are going to have to serve. Yes, there is a retreat after emergence in the office now. National Assembly retreat. Those ones are ceremonial. Nothing much has been, will been done there. It's for when they spend a lot of money on procurement. I mean, I hear you speak, and what I understand is you believe that there is need for our leaders to be armed with the required knowledge. Yes. But between the three of us here, mm. just from having this conversation, I would say that progressive thoughts have mm. been shared. So it is not necessarily a lack of knowledge of what is wrong. Mm. But don't you think it is a lack of the political will and the lack of good intentions for moving this country forward? That is why I am saying that it shouldn't be when you have even image. Consciously, for six months, become part of you. The will. The, somebody needs to trigger that will. Sir, you are going here. Where are you coming from? You are going here for, to represent the people Everything you are going to do, let the major of be about the people. While well, I the president, the, cha the governor, the whatever, once you are people's governor, as they call themselves, you are people's governor, you see the level of insecurity because you, have every, you listen, people listen to you, you get to people. But you see a senator who can vast for what? For one year. One year he sit down in Abuja and tell you he has not been home because of insecurity. Can I step in here? Because I understand where Ashashi is coming from. And it's something that we see um, in various stories that, that we, that various stories that we take on this couch. And that is simply the lack of will. I'd like to draw us back to the um, topic. One of the things that we have seen in recent times is, um, for instance, I'll call on uh, Zamfara State. There was a time the governor came out and made many claims that the people who are mining um, a lot of the gold, I think this was probably a, a year, a last year, people that are mining the gold are not indigents of Zamfara. And he made all sorts of uh, claims and preferred all sorts of solutions. And on the face of it, the federal government banned mining for some time. Now, the truth of the matter is they might have banned mining, but there were no consequences to those who were coming in and taking out. Mm. Now, the same thing seems to be going on even in the Niger Delta, where, yes, on the face of it, there are loads of Niger Delta and, or uh, indigents who are running this board and running that board. But when you begin to look at the assets, the assets are not a reflection of the, of the region. Rather, those who are owning the assets are not a reflection of the region. Those who are operating on the assets are not a reflection of the region, which calls into question the actual, um, when you look at it, Nigeria is at uh, a disadvantage because those who are profiting from Nigeria are foreigners. And I'll just quickly draw another example from Ghana. We remember we sat here on this couch last week, it was, when we heard that um, the president of Ghana, Nana Akufo, I said, there's no more exporting of cocoa. Why? Because of the cocoa market, Ghana was earning the least. And the, the, those who are coming and, in, you know, buying the cocoa legally are the ones who are profiting the most. So 
just to just to uh, bring it back home, while on the face of it, it looks like indigents are doing or are or have the power to do what ought to be done. It looks like there's vested interest from outsiders. So how do we bring that back? You see, in what parts of the world are interested wherever there is resources? From US, the China, the Asian, they are they are interested where there is resources. That's why if you have a problem where there is no resources, you will not see anybody to come and rescue you. So, in other words, whenever there is problem where there is resources, people are not coming because of that problem. They are coming for your resources. It's quite unfortunate that Nigeria, within from 1961 to 2014 supply 30.74 barrel of 30.74 billion barrel of crude oil to the international community earning as much as 30 billion usd but all those things fail to diversify fail to diversify fail to provide basic amenities to the people because of the ineptitude, inefficiency, the corrupt nature of the elite. Still relying on the oil, on the face of oil. Or what would have expected that such wisdom of money is used for the world diversification you have been hearing all the way. You have Ajakuta still there, not working. I expected, uh, I expected our refineries, two sound refineries should be working in Nigeria right Mr. now. Mr. Maman, I have to come mm. in here yeah. because specifically, mm. I think I've used this word too many times, but it's because sometimes we look at these conversations from a very broad angle. And I agree with Ney. When people commit an offense, there should be some sort of repercussion. Yes. And that way, mm. someone else is mm. not likely to do that. Mm -hmm. Until 2019, Shell, which is, I would consider, the biggest shareholder in our oil revenue, yes. had not paid any sort of remittance for the past 16 years. And until 2019, mm. we got over um, 700 billion naira, which is equal to, as of that time, um, $2 billion. Mm. When you think about it, that, that, that should get them banned for a while. That, that should get them punished. Now, not just so long ago, we are seeing that oil companies are being asked to remit. Oil companies are being asked to do what is right by the people of these mm. host communities. And so when you look at that story, you can see a narrative here where people do as they like. And we're not even talking about Nigerians. We're talking about foreigners, mm. foreign investors mm. coming into the country. So don't you see how there is a complete lack of responsibility and discipline in a sector that is our biggest revenue generator. You see, if you see, when we start this conversation, we are mostly on the political will of those in position of authority, right? Starting with the responsibility, either in terms of revenue collection or generation, starting with the responsibility even to punish those who fail to but there is an internal collaborator who is working with this uh, multinational corporation or the big banks, right? And until as people, we have we have to address such example. Um, we had uh, a former minister of finance. Right? Kemi Adeusu. So you and I know she was doing pretty well as the Minister of Finance. Asking them, if you don't remit this, that. But what happened to her? There are a lot of, she's just one out of many victims of coming out to do the needful. So until from the top to the bottom, we have the will to do what is right. When it is right, either we like to do it or not. That's self-discipline. That is political will. 
And on that note, unfortunately, we have to draw the morning bugle to um, an end. Mr. Oganya Abdul Razak Maman, thank you so much for sitting on this couch. It's always a pleasure to have you here. The pleasure is of mine. Thank you for coming. Well, unfortunately, so the Morning Bugle comes to a swift end. Of course, don't worry if you've missed it. You can always check back on our YouTube channel for the whole show. Uh, my name is Neopia Clark, and we're hoping that you have a good day here at NCBM. And my name is Ashashi Yata. As we said earlier, this is Compliment Tuesday, so say something kind to someone next to you. I'm Ashashi Yata once again saying goodbye. Have a great day. <laughs>